Welcome back, everybody. Today we're looking at Chapter 13, Section 2, The Republic of Texas. And yesterday we looked at reasons the people were moving into the Oregon country. Now today we're going to shift our focus to the south and look at how Texas was able to break away from Mexican rule to establish the Republic of Texas, the Lone Star Republic. And like always, uh, you can see that I've done an audio recording, and today's picture is of Davy Crockett, because we will talk about Davy Crockett today. But if you want to continue with our video recording, let's move on to the key terms. And our key terms for today are Dictator, Tejano, the Alamo, Siege, which is a military blockade, the Battle of San Jacinto, the Lone Star Republic, and annex and this is the verb annex which means to take or to take over or to add all right let's um let's move into the lesson for today all right so to start off we're looking here at the entire country of mexico as it looked up through the 1820s now as you can see the united states kind of ends at Texas and then goes up and you've got unorganized territory and then the Oregon territory, which, like we said before, was shared between the United States and Great Britain. And this entire area that we're looking at now, which encompasses uh, Texas, Colorado, uh, California, New Mexico, Nevada, Arizona, this was all part of Spanish Mexico. So by 1821, Mexico's Spanish rulers began allowing American farmers to move into this area, which was known as Texas. Until that time, Spain had refused to allow Americans to set up colonies and to move into its area. But in 1821, the Spanish government gave Moses Austin a land grant to start a new colony in what is now Texas. Now, unfortunately, Moses died before he could set up a colony, so the responsibility was passed on to his son, Stephen. However, before Stephen could set up a colony, Mexican, Mexico had won its independence from Spain. So Stephen Austin traveled to Mexico City to make sure that the newly established Mexican government would still allow Americans to settle in, in Texas, and the Mexican government agreed to that. So, good stuff. At the time, only about 4,000 Mexicans were living in the Texas area. So, Austin, who we're looking at right now, planned on bringing about 300 American families into that area to develop the land for farming. Now, most of the settlers came from the southern United States and brought their slaves along with them. And as Austin's colony grew and succeeded, Mexico gave grants to other people. And by 1830, so in just nine years, over 20,000 Americans were living in Mexico, specifically in the area that is now Texas. The more farms produced, the more the Mexican government received. So the successes of the farms encouraged Mexico to continue allow Americans to cross the border. Stephen Austin was the first and most successful of the American impresarios, men licensed to advertise and sell land to settlers. Austin recruited 300 American families to his new Texas colony, but just as they arrived, trouble arose in the land. No sooner does Stephen F. Austin bring his, the first of his colonists to settle on the banks of the Brazos River does he find that there has been a revolution in Mexico City. In 1821, Mexico declares its independence from Spain just like the United States had in 1776 declared its independence from Great Britain. Mexico was no longer a colony of Spain. Mexico is now an independent republic. The question in Austin's mind, and indeed in the minds of all of the American colonists, 
is the new Mexican government going to honor the deal Moses had made with the old Spanish government? Well, there's only one way to find out. Austin has to mount his horse and make the long, arduous overland journey to Mexico City. Austin's trip to Mexico City was a success. The new Mexican government also agreed to let Austin settlers bring slaves to Texas, receiving 80 acres of land for each slave they brought. By 1825, 1,800 people lived in Austin's colony, 443 of them slaves of African and Caribbean descent. The Americans were expected to accept and abide by Mexican law. Some did. Many others did not. There were many American squatters, people who settled upon land for which they had not paid and did not have permission to occupy. Some of these were criminals running away from the law or poor people trying to escape their debts in the U.S. The Mexicans looked down on them. Jose Maria Sanchez was a Mexican draftsman sent in 1828 by the Mexican government to survey the Texas province border with Louisiana. Sanchez came back with a very critical assessment of the American settlers. Mexico officially reversed its immigration policy, not allowing any more American settlers to come to Texas. The Mexicans also banned the further importation of slaves. They imposed heavy taxes on American goods, and they sent troops to the frontier to enforce the new laws. Nevertheless, Americans continued to stream into Texas. So the original agreement that was set up between Austin and the Mexican government was that the American settlers would become Mexican citizens and worship in the Roman Catholic Church. But these new settlers that were coming in really felt no loyalty to Mexico. First, most of them were Protestant, so no loyalty to the Catholic Church. And second, many of them spoke very little Spanish, if, if they spoke Spanish at all. So no loyalty to Mexico. So divisions started showing up between the American settlers and the Mexican government. And in 1830, with over 20,000 Americans living in Texas, the Mexican government started barring any more Americans from settling in that area. And because of these divisions that were popping up, they feared that Americans would try to make Texas a part of the United States. Now, originally, remember, the, the setup was that they would become Mexican citizens, but now the Mexican government is seeing that as more and more Americans are flooding into this area, there's a good chance that these Americans living in this area are going to want the area to become a part of America. And since the United States had tried to buy that land twice before, those fears that the Mexican government had had some pretty good grounds. So to show that it was still in charge, Mexico started enforcing the old laws by requiring Texans to become Mexican citizens and to worship in Roman Catholic churches. And they also banned slavery, and that was the law that especially angered many of the Texans. So that was 1830. By 1833, General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana became the dictator of Mexico and threw out the Mexican Constitution. And if you remember, a dictator is a general or someone that is com in complete control of the government. And when Santa Ana took over, rumors began to spread that he was going to try and drive the Americans out of Texas. So uh, the Americans took these rumors as a sign that it was time for action. And the Americans had the support of many Tejanos, and, a, and Tejano is a person of Mexican descent born in Texas. But the Tejanos didn't necessarily want independence from Mexico, they just wanted Santa Ana out of power. In October of 1835, Texans in the, in the town of Gonzales clashed with Mexican troops and 
forced them to withdraw. And this victory in Gonzales was an inspiration to Texans to push for their own independence from Mexico. And within two months, Texans occupied the city of San Antonio, and that was when Santa Ana decided to march north from the Mexican capital of Mexico City. Now, while Santa Ana was marching north, on March 2nd of 1836, a group of Texans declared independence from Mexico. And Sam Houston was put in charge of an army of volunteers from the United States, as long as, along with African Americans and Tejanos. So, October of 1835, the Battle of Gonzales. And that inspires other Texans to try and revolt against Mexico. After two months of fighting, Santa Ana starts to march northward, but while he is marching northward, on March 2nd, 1836, a group of Texans declared their independence from Mexico. Men who wanted Texas to break away from Mexico and join the United States unified into the War Party. It was from the ranks of these rebellious settlers that two legends of Texas emerged, Jim Bowie and Sam Houston. By the time he came to Texas, Jim Bowie was already something of a legend up and down the Mississippi River. Born in Kentucky, he uh, spent his boyhood in L Louisiana where he was said to have hunted bear and wrestled alligators. Uh, but as he grew uh, to manhood, he got involved in some shady dealings. He was a land speculator, and that would have been fine, but he also seems to have uh, had a career dealing in forged land certificates. So what we're talking about here is uh, land fraud. Sam Houston came to Texas to try to rebuild his shattered life. By the time he was 34, Houston had been a member of the U.S. House of Representatives and had become the youngest governor in the history of Tennessee. But Houston fell on personal and political hard times. He resigned his governorship in disgrace and moved to Texas in 1832, attempting to make money through land speculation. Instead, his fame was later to be made through his military and political service in Texas. Houston joined the war party shortly after his arrival. So by the time Santa Ana reached San Antonio, a Texan army had taken up positions in an old Spanish mission known as the Alamo. Uh, and I'm going to bring up a picture of the Alamo here. The Texans were, that were in the Alamo were very poorly equipped and had very little actual combat training. Supplies of ammunition, food, and water were very low, and with Santa Ana's army marching in, they were about to face incredible odds. The Texan army in the Alamo numbered about 150 men, and they were about to face off against Santa Ana's army of 6,000 well-trained Mexican troops. The Alamo itself was actually originally a Spanish mission, and it had served as a home to missionaries and their Indian converts in the San Antonio area, and it served this purpose for nearly 70 years. So Santa Ana's on his way, and during the struggle for Texas independence, Colonel William Travis led his band of rebels to San Antonio and fortified the Spanish mission in early 1836. And on February 23rd, 1836, with the arrival of General Santa Anna and his army, it really caught them by surprise. But undaunted, the Texans and Tejanos prepared to defend the Alamo together. And the defenders were actually able to hold out for 13 days against Santa Anna's army. And I want to bring this picture back up and show you the Alamo is not a fort. The Alamo was a mission that was originally the home to missionaries living in this area and their Indian converts and had served that purpose for nearly 70 years. It was it had been constructed in 1724 and once San Antonio's missions were secularized, 
uh, the land was distributed to the remaining Indian residents and had basically been ser serving as like a center of culture and a center for the Indians living in this area and farming in this area. So it's not a fort. It was, it was just a mission, but the defenders were able to hold out for 13 days against Santa Ana's army. William B. Travis, the commander of the Alamo, sent couriers carrying pleas for help to communities around Texas. And on the eighth day of the siege, a band of 32 volunteers from Gonzales arrived, bringing the number of defenders from 150 to almost 200. And legend holds that with the possi possibility of additional help fading, Colonel Travis drew a line on the ground and asked any man willing to leave to step over that line, and only one stepped. As the defenders saw it, the Alamo was the key to the defense of Texas, and they were ready to give their lives rather than surrender their position to General Santa Ana. Among the Alamo's defenders are pictures we just looked at of Jim Bowie, a renowned knife fighter, uh, David Crockett, famed frontiersman and former congressman from Tennessee. Nearly half a mile of adobe wall surrounds the Alamo. In some places, it is as low as six feet, in others as high as 12. But in the southeast corner, it stops. A palisade of sharpened stakes plugs the gap, but it is still the weakest point in the fort. Travis assigns the best marksmen, the Tennessee Volunteers, to defend this position. Among them is a genuine folk hero with a sense of humor and a reputation for action. His name is Davy Crockett. Crockett is a legend straight out of the penny press. He's a veteran of Andrew Jackson's campaign in the Creek Indian War, known for his tall tales of frontier life. A cross between Pecos Bill and Paul Bunyan, he claimed to have shot 47 bears in one month and ridden alligators for exercise. But after losing his seat in Congress in a bitter election battle, he told the voters that he was going to Texas. Crockett is not the only famous character among the Alamo defenders. Jim Bowie is already a legend in the American West. He's known for his brawling, freewheeling style and the formidable knife which bears his name. He was born in the bayous of Louisiana, where he made his fortune partnering in the slave trade with the pirate Jean Lafitte. By 1828, he'd moved on to Bejar, where he married the daughter of the Mexican vice governor of Texas and began investing in tales of lost silver mines. But his wife died and his fortune soured. He became known as a drinker. Now he frequently clashes with Travis. Bowie has been roaring drunk all the time and is proceeding in a most disorderly and irregular manner and turning everything topsy-turvy. Bowie's antics mask a more serious problem. Racked by cough and fever, the 40-year-old Bowie is dying. He will be bedridden for the last 11 days of the siege. Full command of the embattled garrison now passes to William Travis. It is a role he has prepared for his entire life. Born in South Carolina, he migrated to Alabama, where he practiced law, taught school, and published a newspaper. In 1831, he abruptly packed up and left his wife and young son. Starting over, he hung out his legal shingle in Texas and organized a local militia for which he served as captain. In January 1836, he and his men arrived to reinforce the Alamo. As a man, Travis is ambitious and self-centered, but he is a leader of great ability with a deep sense of mission. A 
As night falls, he sends a courier to the town of Gonzales, 70 miles away, with a message to the people of Texas and all Americans in the world. I am besieged by a thousand or more of the Mexicans under Santa Ana. I have sustained a continual bombardment and cannonade for 24 hours and have not lost a man. I shall never surrender or retreat. Then I call on you in the name of liberty, of patriotism, and everything dear to the American character to come to our aid with all dispatch. If this call is neglected, I am determined to sustain myself as long as possible and die like a soldier who never forgets what is due to his own honor and that of his country. Victory or death. And the final assault on the Alamo came before daybreak on the morning of March 6th, 1836, as column after column of Mexican soldiers emerged from the pre-dawn darkness and headed for the Alamo's walls. Cannon and small arms fire from inside the Alamo beat back several attacks. In regrouping, the Mexicans scaled the walls and rushed into the compound. Once inside, they turned, captured the cannons on the long barrack and church, and blasted open the barricaded doors. The desperate struggle continued until the defenders were just completely overwhelmed. And by sunrise, the battle had ended, and Santa Ana entered the Alamo compound to survey the scene of his victory. Now, while the facts surrounding the siege of the Alamo continue to be debated, there's no doubt that when the, the battle what it has come to symbolize. People worldwide com continue to, quote, remember the Alamo as a heroic struggle against impossible odds, a place where men made the ultimate sacrifice for freedom. And for this reason, the Alamo remains hallowed ground and, a and is the shrine of Texas liberty. In 1836, an old Spanish mission known as the Alamo became the location of a famous battle for independence. The mission was in the town of Bejar, which is now San Antonio, Texas. At the time, Texas belonged to Mexico. But Texas was far from the Mexican capital, and Texians, as the people who settled there call themselves, had little regard for Mexican law. General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, the Mexican president, tried to keep Texas under his control by closing ports and taxing Texians. Late in 1835, the angry Texians rebelled. When the rebellion broke out, Texians seized the Alamo. Though the Alamo was never intended to be a fort, it was capable of withstanding attack. The 150 or so defenders at the Alamo included men of all backgrounds. Most were Anglos, Americans who had traveled to Texas looking for cheap land. Some had lived in Texas for years. Many had just come to Texas after the rebellion began. Folk hero Davy Crockett was one of these men. Crockett was a well-known figure of frontier life. Jim Bowie was another Alamo defender. He had gained fame for his skill with a knife. During the siege of the Alamo, however, Bowie was very sick with fever and on the brink of death. Colonel William Travis, along with Bowie, was in charge of the garrison. A number of the defenders were Tejanos, or Mexican residents of Texas. Many of these men did not want Texas independence, but did want to depose Santa Ana. There were also 14 women and children living in the Alamo. They were the families of some of the defenders. On February 23, 1836, Santa Ana led the leading units of his massive army into the area around Bejar. This group of 350 men easily captured the town without firing a single shot. But his real goal was the nearby Alamo. The mission turned fortress guarded one of the two roads from Mexico to Texas and Santa Ana and the Texians both wanted to control it. 
Santa Ana made camp to wait for the rest of his men. He raised a red flag from the church of San Fernando to signify his intention to fight to the death. The flag meant his soldiers would take no prisoners and show no mercy. Bowie sent a message asking Santa Ana to negotiate. But Santa Ana's response was grim, surrender or die. As night fell, Travis sent a messenger to Goliad, the main Texian stronghold, with a plea for reinforcements. He knew that his small force would be greatly outnumbered by the Mexicans. Over the next days, Travis's fears were confirmed. Santa Ana's army continued to grow as new troops arrived. Eventually, the Mexicans would have about ten times the number of Alamo defenders. Travis and his men were determined to stand their ground. But Travis knew they needed help. A few days later, he sent another message begging for reinforcements. The next day, Colonel James Fannin led 320 men and four cannons out of Goliad toward the Alamo. But misfortune befell the eager men. On the first day, their wagons came apart and the men were forced to make camp for the night. Fannin and his officers met to discuss their situation. The force was short of food and worried about being attacked by another Mexican army marching toward them. Disheartened, they decided to head back to Goliad. Supplies at the Alamo were running low, but the mission was well fortified with 20 cannons. The defenders also had a naval gun, which could reach as far as Bejar. The Mexicans had no guns that could be used at such long distances. They were kept at bay for seven days waiting for their large 12-pound cannons to arrive. Meanwhile, about 30 Texians from Gonzales managed to break through Mexican lines and join the rest of the Alamo defenders. The defenders had hoped for more reinforcements, but they were happy to have the extra men. Two days later, in the town of Washington on the Brazos, delegates met to declare the independence of the Republic of Texas. The Texas War for Independence was now official. Eleven days had passed since the beginning of the siege, and Santa Ana was restless. He was tired of waiting for his cannons to arrive. He also worried that the longer he waited to attack, the more likely it would be that the Texian reinforcements would come. On March 6, 1836, Santa Ana stopped waiting. He ordered his men, along with the six cannon batteries he already had, to form lines around the Alamo. The time had come to begin the assault. At 5.30 in the morning, the Mexican army began its attack. The Alamo defenders were caught off guard, but somehow managed to overcome the first two Mexican advances. But in this early fighting, Travis was shot and killed. Santa Ana and his riflemen concentrated on the south wall in an effort to divert the defender's attention from his real goal, the north wall. He wanted to overpower that wall, from which the defenders could not shoot down at the Mexicans without endangering themselves. The plan worked. The Mexicans began to scale the north wall and break through the barracks. They captured the defender's cannon and began using the guns against them. In the end, the battle took only about an hour. By 6.30 a.m., the Mexicans had taken the Alamo. Though victors, the Mexicans had suffered badly in the attack. Nearly 600 had been killed or wounded. Some of the defenders of the Alamo were taken prisoner, but Santa Ana had them executed. Between the fighting and those executions, all the Alamo defenders were killed. However, Santa Ana released the 14 women and children. Santa Ana also ordered the defenders' bodies burned. He wanted the Texian rebels to know that he would give them no mercy. Although the Alamo had fallen, the Texan revolution continued. 
Just one month after the Alamo, Sam Houston and his men defeated the Mexican army at San Jacinto. They captured Santa Ana and forced him to accept the independence of Texas. The Texians ran into this final battle crying, Remember the Alamo. The Alamo serves as a symbol of the bravery of those who fought for Texas independence. Within its walls, the memory of the heroic last stand of the Alamo defenders lives on. The deaths of Commander William Travis, Jim Bowie, and Davy Crockett angered Americans as cries of, Remember the Alamo! rang out throughout the land. Americans flocked to Texas and, led by Commander Sam Houston, defeated Santa Ana's forces at the Battle of San Jacinto. And on May 14, 1836, Santa Ana grudgingly recognized Texas independence. They had already declared independence on in March of 1836, uh, with 59 men signing what we're looking at here, which was Texas's Declaration of Independence. But on May 14th, Santa Ana actually acknowledged Texan independence. Santa Ana figured that the siege of the Alamo and the massacre at Goliad would crush the morale of the rebels. He was wrong. Instead, the losses only intensified the efforts of the people in the United States to help out the Texans. Remember the Alamo and Remember Goliad became rallying battle cries for the Texas and U.S. rebellion. While the details of the Texas Constitution were being debated, Sam Houston retreated east with his army toward the Gulf Coast port of San Jacinto. It was there that he fought the decisive battle of the Texas Revolution. Santana actually assured the Texian success by separating himself, the commander of the army, from the main bulk of the army and going off with a very small detachment in an effort to capture the Texas government. Well, they didn't capture the Texas government, but they did place themselves in a position to be cut off by Sam Houston and his rebel army. And that army attacked on April the 21st, 1836. When Santa Ana's troops stopped to rest, Houston and his troops were hiding nearby. Houston ordered a bridge behind the Mexican troops burned down so that neither the Texans nor the Mexicans could escape from the areas surrounded by water. Houston led the charge, and the Texan forces wiped out the Mexican forces, taking Santa Ana prisoner. The Mexican dictator was forced to sign a treaty acknowledging Texas as an independent republic and expanding its borders. As soon as Santa Ana was released, he and the Mexican legislature renounced the treaties as illegal and refused to acknowledge Texas sovereignty. They made no effort to reclaim Texas for fear of ending up in a war with the United States. Andrew Jackson recognized the independent Republic of Texas on his last day in office as President of the United States. Now, Texan Americans were not the only ones fighting for independence. Uh, the Tejanos had hoped for greater control over their local affairs, so they fought side by side with Houston's troops against Santa Ana's soldiers. And after their war, there was quite a bit of disillusionment. The Americans who swarmed into Texas did not distinguish between Tejanos, who had been born in Texas, and Mexicans. And in the decade that followed, the Tejanos found themselves shut out of the new Texas government as well. And we're looking here at a man named Jose Antonio Navarro, the most influential Tejano of his generation. And he was one who really championed Texan independence from Mexico and fought for the rights of Tejanos in the Republic of Texas and in the United States. Now, I mention that because most Texan Americans, at this remember, Texas is its own independent nation. Most of them wanted Texas to be annexed or brought into the United States because they feared that the Mexican government would soon try to recapture that land. Many had originally come from the American South and had 
great interest in becoming another southern state. But President Andrew Jackson saw there was there was some trouble with this. Many Whigs and abolitionists in the North refused to admit another slave state into the Union. But rather than risking the nation, tearing the nation apart over this controversial issue, Jackson did not pursue annexation of Texas. And as a result of this, the Lone Star flag, as we're looking at right now, flew proudly over the Lone Star Republic for nine years as Texas remained an independent country. And this is the Lone Star flag, which at that point was the flag of the Republic of Texas, now the state flag of Texas. Even though the Spanish lost Florida, they still controlled a lot of territory, including the colony Tejas. Because the population of Tejas was very sparse, Spain offered land grants to anyone willing to settle there, as long as they agreed to obey Spanish law. Moses Austin from Missouri took up the offer, but he died before he could establish his colony. So his son Stephen took over the claim. Stephen Austin arrived there in 1821, just as Mexico and Tejas won independence from Spain. By 1827, nearly 300 families had moved to Austin's colony. When news of the rich lands and grassy plains spread, other settlers arrived in droves, almost all of them from the United States. The greatly outnumbered Tejanos, Texans of Spanish heritage, resented the Americans and the Americans, in turn, disliked the Tejanos. Tensions grew. So, Stephen Austin went to Mexico City to meet with the Mexican president, Antonio Lopez Santa Ana. Austin proposed that Texas be made an independent state within Mexico. Santa Ana did not accept the proposal. Instead, he led an army of 6,000 north. In response, a group of Texans declared Texas a free and independent republic. They named Sam Houston to lead their army. In reality, it wasn't much of an army. It was two small forces. One, a band of 420 men stationed at Goliad in southeast Texas. The other, a small group of volunteers occupied the Alamo, a fortress mission in San Antonio. The Texans were also supported by a band of 25 Tejanos led by Juan Seguin. On February 23, 1836, Santa Ana's army surrounded San Antonio. The next day, he attacked the Alamo. The Battle of the Alamo has become one of America's greatest stories. About 187 volunteers, including legends such as Davy Crockett and Jim Bowie, held off the Mexican army for 12 days until, on the 13th day, they ran out of ammunition. The Texans refused to surrender. None of the men survived. When Sam Houston heard of the defeat at the Alamo, he ordered the 420 men at Goliad to retreat, but they were captured by Santa Ana. 300 were executed. The massacre only spurred the Texans on. In April 1836, near the San Jacinto River, Sam Houston's Texans faced Santa Ana's men. Half of the Mexican army was killed in the first 18 minutes. Santa Ana was forced to sign a treaty declaring the independence of Texas. In September of 1836, Texas raised the Lone Star flag, and Sam Houston was elected president of the new republic. But most Texans were Americans, and they wanted to join the Union. So Texas petitioned Congress for statehood. After much wheeling and dealing, in 1845, Texas was admitted as the 28th state. It was the first and only independent republic to join the Union. Which brings us to today's assignment. Now that we've gone through the lesson, uh, there's a short quiz that's attached to attached to this assignment, and you'll have two attempts. So take your time. But it, the the first of question will ask you to put the events in chronological order. So like when it actually happened. So you may need to refer back to the lesson or to your textbook to make sure that you have the correct uh, chronological orders. And it's, it'd be in pages 385 to 389. So good luck. If you have any questions, please come and find me. Otherwise, have a great rest of your day.